Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lines. I'm your host, Shane Mercer, and look, we got Andrew Pace back in the chair. He's the founder of In Play Live, only the greatest sports betting community on planet Earth. But today we are going to hear from another person from a different sports betting community, and we're talking all about analytics. Very interesting topic. Pace, before we dive into it, I've got to remind everyone out there to like, download, subscribe, follow us on all the socials at In Play Live. And if you want to get a little peek behind the curtain, see what it's all about from the inside, we encourage you to sign up and we have a special promo code for you that is behind the lines, all caps. It will give you the very best pricing to join In Play Live. All right, Pace, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about analytics For me, when I think about analytics, I get a little flashback to grade 12 math and my (laughs) eyes glazing over. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit stoned and maybe I'm daydreaming a little bit about the girl in front of me. The last (laughs) thing I'm paying attention to are the numbers on the chalkboard. And that's what (laughs) analytics meant to me, at least for a long time. Uh, (laughs) But over my sports betting journey, I've sort of come to embrace it a little bit and kind of understand it a little bit more. and, And it really... You know, stats, numbers, figures. This is what sports is all about, right? What, what does analytics mean to you, though? I don't know. Apparently, you just got me thinking about my high school crush instead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does analytics mean to me? Gosh, I mean, there's a part of me that where my gut just says it means noise. <clears throat> but that would be a, a naive thing to say, given the impact that it actually can make on your actual betting success. But I think uh, for analytics, uh, simply put, I would say, you know, that's that's sort of taking uh, the the best and best information that you can possibly have access to and uh, organizing it in a way um, to sort of prove a theory uh, as it relates to, um, you know, in, in this case, as it relates to a particular game or season or, or um, a, a model, perhaps relating to a, a certain sport. Um, it it's information and information is power as we, we touch on many, many times. And then, and, and using that information, hopefully then this isn't, this is outside of where I'd put the definition, but using that information to actually hopefully ch- turn a profit or, or succeed uh, with it as a result. Yeah. You know, I always go back to, to, to the movie Moneyball and I think about analytics in baseball, a, a sport that is so heavily reliant on analytics um, not that others aren't, but baseball sort of comes to mind as, as sort of the first sport I think of when I think of betting and analytics because of the role that it plays. And, you know, a movie like Moneyball sort of gives you a glimpse at to how you can use analytics, you know, looking at the past, creating models and coming up with projections for the future. Now, I know, you know, when we talk about that idea and you sort of mentioned it being noise, you know, again, we don't want to make predictions on this show we're not here to project the future or come up with forecasts or anything like that but there is a certain amount of hey if you look at what's happened in the past it might give you an indication as to what could happen in the future right well i i even struggle with that concept i think what i look at is we go back to our episode on chaos and we look at the the two the two armed pendulum and we go okay We just saw the pendulum swing out to the right. Which way is it going to move now? And that's where you can use what's happened uh, recently to best predict the next movement or motion. So we talk about the weatherman being wrong. Is the weatherman ever right? Hell yeah, the weatherman's right, right? Um, Was the temperature spot on? Did it rain? Did it not rain? All all those types of things. Uh, Those are those forecasts and those are those analytics that obviously do have a baked in level of success. Um, But then again, once we get into that, the real specifics where the cloud were was at exactly which time and, and where the rain fell and and if it fell and and precisely how much of it fell and, and all those kind of things. So can you see where the pendulum is now and then go, hey, it's going to move this way next? Yes, but will you know exactly where that, that the end of the pendulum, that dot will actually fall? The answer is just, is just no. So when I think of analytics and I think of forecasting and I think of using the past to, for lack of a better term, predict the future, I simply look at it as <clears throat> we aren't predicting the future. All we are doing is trying to find an edge, which is theoretical value. So 
can we use analytics to develop theoretical value? And can we do that over time? And the answer, of course, is yes. So will we get this one game right? Uh, may, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, will we get a profit over the course of, you know, said season or time frame as it relates to this theoretical value? Well, we don't know the answer to that right now, but after having looked back at a certain period of time using those analytics, then perhaps you can answer uh, yes, as it re as it relates to that theor theoretical value, and and of course that's uh, that's where the the basis of making money on sports is 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 sort of founded. Yeah, e exactly right. Well, um, that brings us to our guest for the show this week. Um, I had a chance to speak with a guy named Harry Crane. This guy has a PhD in statistics. He teaches at prominent universities in the U.S. He studies this stuff. And, and had an interest in this from an early age and, and got into it and, you know, went to school and, and did all of that. And then he found sports and sports betting. And he realized, hey, based on my background, I might be able to, to do okay at this. I might be able to make some money at this. And it turns out he was actually really, really good at it. And so he is trying to teach people about analytics and how it applies to sports betting. So I had an opportunity to catch up with him again. Uh, his name is Harry Crane, and we will now show you that interview. I hope you all enjoy it. And Pace, you and I will talk about it on the other side. So here's that interview now. Harry Crane is a statistics professor and is the founder of analytics.bet. Harry, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, really happy to have you on. Harry, the whole purpose of this show is to help average recreational sports bettors become better bettors by teaching them about the sports betting industry, how it works, how it's designed for betters to lose over time. And then we offer advice to help them improve their wagering process. So, uh, Harry, before we sort of mine you for advice, how did you get into sports betting? Uh, well, I, I've been in betting for almost my entire life. So I started betting in uh, around eight or nine years old. I was actually, I guess I was doing sports betting at that time. I was booking bets in my sixth grade class. Uh, later started to run poker games in eighth grade uh, and then uh, took a few years off. But then the poker boom hit in uh, early 2000s. I was, I was heavily involved in that, playing a lot of poker at that time. Got back into sports betting after that. I had a math degree and statistics. So I thought it would be, you know, around mid 2000s, the natural thing would be to to kind of take a bunch of data, analyze it and see if I can make money sports betting. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and then event actually went away from gambling for a while. Uh, got a went to graduate school, got a Ph.D. in statistics. That's that led me into my uh, my career as a professor. Uh, and then it was about you know five six years ago where I, I started to get back into it and uh, focusing focusing specifically on on sports betting and a few other casino games, but primarily sports betting. So, what kind of success have you had? Well, I, I mean, I've I've uh, I guess it depends what you mean by what, what you want what you want to know, but I mean, I've been I guess the the interesting thing is I I mean I'm a winning better. Uh, and I could, I, I suppose, uh, you know, I could, uh, if I wanted to make that my, my career, but, uh, you know, I think that it's actually something that works out well as in addition to the other things that I do, uh, it's a good compliment to it. Um, but I think in terms of the question you asked, you know, what kind of success have I had, you know, I, I say I'm a winner today. Um, but I didn't begin, I didn't start out as a winner. Um, and I think that that's the story of a lot of, a lot of betters. Um, and even somebody, you know, say with my background, I came into it saying I have all the tools, um, but it still took me, you know, a lot longer than I than I would have expected to to get to the point where I was where I was confident in, that I was a that I could be a consistent winner. Uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right. I think that is like most people's stories is that, you know, they they you know, certainly uh, don't start off winning regularly. But like you said, you had all the tools to begin with. So what was it that you felt you were missing? Or, or what did you realize you were missing over time? Well, I think that what I was missing was, you know, my the, to the extent that I had practical experience in betting, it was through poker. 
um, which is is definitely va valuable experience, but it didn't translate so immediately to, to me to, to 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 the sports betting uh, world. Um, and so I guess the the thing that I was missing was predominantly the just the experience, you know, just just actually the practicalities, the logistics of actually placing bets is something that just you know you could be the the smartest math person in the world there's extra stuff going on there that just isn't accounted for by the math or the theory and and there's no substitute for that right so so experience essentially experience you know intuition and and just yeah understanding the um understanding the markets so you know now that you've been doing this for for quite some time uh how would you describe your your general approach to sports betting or or sports betting philosophy if you will well you know my my approach my approach given you know given the the skills that i have is to find i mean there's a there's a few different you know approaches that that i can take um but it is more on the on the technical the mathematical analytical side of things so I'm looking for I'm looking for advantages that I can get that I can get by um, figure. I guess one way would be you take a bunch of data and you just become an expert in the sport that you're interested in, and you build models and and you kind of go that route. And that's something that that I, that's something that I'm involved with. Um, that's a very long and difficult route to go, um, but it's one that can pay off if you have the right people you're working with and you have the, the, the patience and the kind of the, you know, the ability, the perseverance throughout, through all the difficulties there. Um, on the other side, you know, some of the, the biggest and, and best edges that I can get are ones where I see a market or, you know, I look at a, a situation and I say, I, I kind of know what the, I kind of know what the conventional wisdom would be in how you would think about this problem. That's kind of like, you know, the, the, the first, the first idea that would come to my mind is I would do this and then I can kind of test out right away. Okay. Let me see if that's actually what the market is thinking. Is that actually the way these prices are being set is by using that initial approach. And if I can identify that almost right away, then I now have that as my baseline. And I can say, well, if I can improve upon that approach, um, in any way, then I'm going to be able to get an edge on that market. And so that's something that's been, I'd say, pretty, pretty useful for quickly testing ideas and also quickly finding edges that work and throwing away ones that don't. Right. So, so you're building your own models then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And um, are you mainly focused on pregame, or do you do any in-play like live betting? Um, I have, I have both, uh, okay. the, 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 the models. Yeah. I, I have some, some in-play betting for, for specific sports, but not, I haven't explored that to the kind of the, the extent that I would like, I would say I, I, I found some, I actually, the thing, great example there is that the thing that I, I think there's a, there's a lot of value to be gotten out of the in-play betting. Um, the challenge for my approach for, for in-play betting, and, and this is a limitation of, of the approach I bring, which is the, this analytical mathematical approach, is that when you're in play, so much is happening so quickly. And if you're, if you're going to use a, you can't be too sophisticated at the current moment because you're needing a data feed and you're needing all kinds of stuff to, to, have, to, 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 to be processed in such a short period of time. And then you have to execute the bets. Uh, I'm not saying that this is not something other people have probably solved this better than me, but that that was a friction that that I encountered um, in trying to execute. It was an execution problem. Right, right. Well, <laughs> it's funny you say that because you know the the group I'm with in Play Live, we very much focus on live wagering and mm -hmm. and sort of uh, you know have a much higher priority on it than than pregame um, be, because you know we have sort of some some strategies that work really well uh betting betting live um but you're right decisions do have to be made very quickly and it's and it's not exactly uh, uh easy or at least you know initially it, it takes some time to kind of catch on to it um let's talk about the the bigger broader landscape though how would you describe the current state of the sports betting landscape in north america yeah well it's it's a 
it's a strange one in that well the the you've got the the regulated you got the regulated markets coming into you know most states at this point um and they're they're they keep you know i keep, keep adding new states you know every once in a while now and so the the thing that's i think interesting about it is that at first and in, in new jersey this was this was maybe bigger than than in other in most other states is that at first there was a lot of opportunity to take advantage of the marketing and the you know a lot of the the bonuses and the the just the overall you know the excess money that was really flooding into this market and that seems to have i wouldn't say it's dried up entirely but it certainly isn't what it was two three years ago um they are you know most sports books are limiting people very quickly um you know that the game really is you know that that really is where a lot of the game has gone where you're you're if you're playing in the regulated markets um finding a way around that that's that system of of you know getting limited i mean that's always been the game even offshore you have to kind of play that cat and mouse but i think that that's something that i found that it wasn't surprising to me to 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 realize that um but i think that that's one of the issues that people have and some of the students that we have in analytics.bet they want to they want to become either semi professional or professional bettors they may have a good year good two years um but what's the sustainability of that approach given you know given the limitations that you know that the market's putting on you so again it comes down to the the execution and the, the logistics of of actually take of actually you know executing a strategy not so much coming up with the strategy itself you know uh, i'm glad you brought up limiting because that's such a hot topic here on this podcast it comes up all the time so uh, give me a sense of your experience you know in terms of being limited and and how did you navigate that i mean so my my experience was was probably always a bit different than um than most 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 bet individual betters um because i i was always working with groups who can who would you know take care of that that problem you know that was their part of the that was their job and my job was to do you know what i do which is to come up to find the bets to execute to to come up with the bets that we're going to place so to the extent that i experienced limiting it actually was more of a I, a research question than an actual practical problem. I would go, I actually would place bets myself more out of curiosity than anything else to see, you know, if I keep doing this, how long can I get away with it? And let's just kind of test the waters here. Um, because I know people who have survived at, you know, places like DraftKings or, you know, MGM or, or wherever, um, for, oh, year two years um consistently making you know good amounts of money uh and then eventually got limited but they were able to navigate it for that long and it didn't seem like they were doing anything too special on the other hand you you have situations i've been in sometimes you're limited within three four five days so it's hard to know you know i'm sure that there's people i never really investigated it to the point where i understood exactly what's happening but um I think that the results definitely vary uh, across across people and across sports books, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's dive into the analytics side then. How do you use analytics to gain an advantage, or or sort of how do you you know apply your uh, I guess outside sports betting knowledge, experience, and education, and take that and apply it into the world of sports betting? Well, I mean the the way I the way I think about it is this: there there are basically three ways, three three big ways that you can get an advantage. This is you know you can get an advantage in betting. One is to have, you know, the first is information. Next is execution. The the, the last is you know methodology or technology or or you know analytics for for the sake of this conversation. So. You know, to to kind of go through those information is you know if you knew a player was injured before anyone else did, you could you could bet you could bet the line now. You know it's going to move later. You could buy it back. You know it's going to happen. You, you kind of like seeing the future there. Um, and so getting getting inside information or early information is is definitely the most valuable and reliable way to to make money. It's just the least 
probably the least scalable unless you have a really, really reliable source, you know, which is, which is hard. I'm sure there's people who have those execution is, you know, imagining we all have the same information, but you're able to execute on something, you know, faster or more effectively somehow than, than others. And that, that includes this issue of, you know, getting limited or being able to work around the limitations. This includes betting in play in a way, in a way that maybe others can't. The last one is analytics, you know, data crunching, you know, taking, taking all kinds of data and information and trying to process it and get, get a, you know, a, a systematic edge over a large sample. And so the, the, the benefit of that approach is, so the drawback to that approach is that it's rate, the, the edges tend to be much thinner. Um, you know, you might have a one or two or 3% edge, whereas if you have early information, you have a hundred, hundred percent edge or, or higher even, mm -hmm. but if the edge is there, you can, you can scale it to, you know, every game in across leagues and so on and so forth, depending on how you're able to scale your model. So, you know, that, that's been my approach. Um, the key to it is, you know, getting, getting data, you, you know, you get data, you fit statistical models. And, and then a lot of it is really digging into the weeds of understanding, you know, what the math means in the context of, you know, the sport you're, you're analyzing, and then always just figuring out ways to, to tweak it, to make it a little bit better. And to, you know, we're tweaking things on, on very marginal, you know, it's always about squeezing that extra marginal bit out. And then you keep spit, you keep tweaking every little bit of it and you, you kind of work your way up and you keep getting better. That that's, that's the overall approach. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is, is that, you know, you develop models that sort of tend to give you, you know, uh, 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 a 5% edge or so, and then you try to scale it up and apply it, you know, uh, more broadly across leagues or, or sports or however it might be. So that would be the approach. I mean, some, some, some math, some approaches, you know, some models I fit are, you know, I would, I estimate them now in hindsight, given the results as, you know, 200, 300% edges. Um, those are few and far between. But if I'm taking the the, the kind of the, the approach that probably most people think in their head is, you know, you fit a baseball model, you before ever, you have a bunch of baseball data, and then you come up with a model before every game, you have the probability of each game, you know, going over, under, uh, you know, the, the, the spreads, the money lines. That's something that is along the lines you're saying, yeah, if you can get a 5% edge at that, you're, you're in business because you can bet, you know, a good number of games, you can get a lot of good, good number, of, get, a, get a good amount of volume down because there's a good amount of games. Um, in other cases where maybe the, maybe the, maybe there are, isn't as much volume, there isn't as much quantity, but the mistake, can, you know, if you can identify the mistake, you can get a much larger edge even on some of these mathematical uh, approaches because you're using more advanced math. So I guess it's kind of a balancing between, do you, you don't need to be kind of a math wizard to fit some, you know, to fit a model. You just, in a lot of cases, you have to know a little bit of regression statistics and you just got to really work hard to hone that model towards the goal, towards the particular domain that you're interested in. Um, but then on the flip side of it, certain very specific situations, if you know enough, you can really get a huge edge by essentially applying a technique that nobody knows about that isn't priced into the market. Um, what would you say the average sports better simply doesn't understand about data analytics, you know, how, and, and how does that, that impact their success or, or lack thereof? I guess to the extent that I mean, I'm assuming most sports betters really never, never even go the route of, you know, data analytics. Um, may, maybe I'm wrong about that, but the ones that do and the ones that try it, I think that what they, what I would, what what they're likely to miss is how how difficult it is, you know, how, how much work it's going to take to actually get this thing to to work. You know, it's it's not something you do over a weekend and then on by Monday morning, you've got a, a winning baseball model. Um, it's, it's multiple. If only it were that easy, eh? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, you know, if going back to your, one of your first questions, that 
in, in a lot of ways was my initial mistake. The thing I didn't know, didn't realize, you know, is how hard it would be. So it's in my case, it's multiple years of, of work to get something to work. So it's, you know, and maybe I'm just slow. And but although I, I don't think I'm that's an outlying case, I think that it can take one, two, three, four years to get something that that is going to be reliable to give you an edge. Because there's just so much you can do wrong. And so I think that that's maybe the thing is that it's going to take a long time. It's the things that are going to matter are not the things you're thinking are, are a lot of just stupid, annoying things um, that you don't really want to think about, like data entry and data accuracy and, and things like that. Um, and it's it's probably harder. It's harder than you want it to be. And so if you don't love it or if you're not if you don't already kind of have a passion for it and you're not predisposed to just enjoying what you're doing and, and really just digging into it and going for it, then, then there's a good chance you, eventually you're going to want to give up. You know, and, and to, to a certain extent, it sounds like you're actually talking to sort of the past you who is also uh, a statistics professor, a PhD in statistics. I mean, the average sports better probably doesn't have those things might not even be very good at math or even have a, you know, a solid understanding, let alone a, a university degree in the, in the field, right? So how does somebody like that approach data analytics when they, when they hear this podcast? So it's hard. I'm, I, so I can't say, I have no idea how someone without my background would approach data and analytics, which isn't to say they can't. It's just that I can't speak to that experience. What I can say, though, is that, you know, I've wondered over, I've wondered from time to time, you know, you would think my background has to give me an advantage somehow. And I'm sure, and I'm sure it does. I can't, you know, say that it doesn't, but there's probably also things about it that gives me, puts me at a disadvantage in, in some, you know, strange or backwards way, you know, where I'm coming at it from too, too mathematical of a perspective or too theoretical, or I'm trying to make everything perfectly fit together in this kind of mathematical framework. When at the end of the day, you do have to be able to, there is a balance between the art and the science, the, you know, the creativity and kind of the technical, just doing things right. But you also have to be able to kind of know where it's okay to break the rules a little bit to, to get something in there that, that the math, that that's the math isn't really clean, but it works and it makes sense in a, in a domain context. And so I think that that's the balance. And there's definitely people out there who have, you know, who have that down pat. And I think they tend to have much quicker and, and you know, better success than someone, someone like me who's coming at it from, from a much more technical standpoint. Yeah, you know, it really sounds like you're the type of person, you know, sports is chaos, um, which we've talked about quite a bit here on this podcast. And you sort of sound like somebody who is doing your very best to use the tools, use your knowledge, your experience to apply some kind of order to that chaos. Would, would that be correct? Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, that's exactly, exactly the way to put it. And, and I guess then, you know, how do you kind of embrace that element of chaos, that unpredictability? Well, I think that the, um, I mean, I think that's what draws me and draws kind of a lot of people to, to this type of thing, right? You have this unpredictable outcome or this future outcome that has uncertainty around it. And this is, this is the, op the, the challenge is to, is to do exactly that, right? Is to sift through the noise and to try to figure out what, what's actually going to happen here, what's actually going on. And so actually this is, some of this is related to the, the motivations for, for when we started the, the courses at analytics.bet was, you know, one of my main motivations wasn't necessarily to educate sports bettors or to make them, you know, more profitable, although that, that is part of it. And that ultimately is what, what we're doing. But I just thought the idea of, you know, for me, I don't feel like I actually understood statistics until I started applying it to, to, to gambling and sports betting in particular. Um, and that's because a lot of what I had learned was in context that I didn't really care about biological trials, clinical trials, whatever the case may be. And I didn't understand any of that because I didn't care about it. Um, once I started to work on a problem I cared about, a lot of the more nuanced concepts started to make a lot more sense because I had an example I could go to to say, this is what it means in this context. 
it's pretty straight. It, it makes a lot of sense in that context. So I thought teaching statistics in the context of sports betting was a great way for a lot of people who don't have the background you're talking about, who maybe hated statistics in college, like most people did to actually learn it in a, in a framework that they actually like, that they care about, that's inherently interesting to them. And they'll probably understand and absorb a lot more uh, by doing that. So that was actually a lot of the motivation. Oh, yeah, no, it makes it makes a lot of sense, right? Sort of pull people in by getting them, you know, to to learn maybe something they never wanted to learn, but sort of do it through this lens of something that they're really interested in, i.e. sports betting. Um, I want to ask you, though, and I'm just curious, as part of your um, your strategies and your tactics in, in sports betting, are you deploying any kind of advanced technology? Are you using artificial intelligence in any way? Um, and do you see or, or how do you see artificial intelligence and big data analysis kind of how do you see the future of, of that advanced technology in the sports betting realm? Um, depending what you mean by, you know, the, what, what AI means, it means something different to a lot of people and it's evolving over time. But I think that what you're probably referring to is is, is not something that I'm I'm using uh, any kind of, you know, chat GPT or anything like that at this point. Um, I, th I think about it a lot because, you know, you think, well, how far off are we from somebody being able to, to make use of that? Maybe maybe they already are. Um, but, you know, maybe five years from now, it'll be much more widespread, maybe 10 years, who knows? And someone in my position always has to, you know, we, you always have to be able to evolve, right? Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that's in order for that to become more, more widespread, I mean, the, the, the out of the box. So I guess, you know, the out of the box chat GPT, I don't even know how it would get used. Um, you know, I, you could probably think of some ways, but it itself has a lot of mistakes and it has a lot of errors. You know, there would have to be, you know, one of two things, either it has to become a lot more accurate or you have to build machinery on top of it to be able to interpret what it's spitting out. Sometimes a lot of the time is just complete nonsense. It's not accurate at all. So you have to it's almost like another noise generator for you that has some semblance of of truth and accuracy behind it. So it's like another data generator. So I think it could be an interesting thing to look at. But I guess here's what I, here's what I'll say to that, which is I'm not using that. If I was starting out today, where would I start? You know, it's like you can when you spend enough time in this, you try everything, you know, every, every idea that comes into your head, you're tempted to try it. Right. Um, but the problem is you know, there's only so much time in a day and every idea that you try out is it's not, it's usually not over time you get better, but it's usually not 10 minutes. And then, Oh, I know that doesn't work or 10 minutes. And I know it's going to work. It could be, you know, it could be a week. It could be a month. It could be three months. It could be longer. So, would I be trying to go down this rabbit hole of let me try to figure out how to use chat GPT to beat baseball? Um, I probably am not inclined to do that, but somebody who knows that, but the reason for that also is that I have no expertise in that stuff. I really don't know what's behind it. You know, my whole thing is I don't think that the way I do things is, is the best way uh, or the only way or whatever. It's the best way for me, I think, because I'm trying to leverage the 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 special, you know, maybe the specialty that I have and trying to get as much value and, and edge out of that. Right. So somebody who's coming at it from a totally different angle should be trying to leverage their edge totally differently. Right. So if, if somebody who has machine learning and large language model expertise you know, maybe they should start out that way. That would be a very natural place to start. And they might be able to really have a breakthrough. Someone who's coming at it, you know, with my, with what I know, or even less than what I know from a statistics perspective, um, I, I feel like you're going to end up kind of, there, there's probably easier and better ways to go about it. Or you're going to end up in a dead end more likely than not. Um, but before we wrap up our conversation, I just want to ask you, because, you know, I know this is something that, that comes up, you know, and it's something that, that winning sports betters kind of have to deal with all the time. And I'm curious as to how you deal with it. Um, 
the idea that, look, Harry, the sports books are designed for you to lose. There's no way to beat them over time. Betting on sports is just a, a losing plan. There's no way you can be successful doing it. Uh, what do you say to those to those people out there that just don't think it's possible to win betting on sports? Well, I mean, the the well, it's 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 not true. I mean, it, for for stars, I mean, the, there's there's plenty of people who've who've done it from you know you're going back you know 50 years to the present day. Um, there are people. And there's books written about these people. There's movies made made about them that not only make money and make a living betting on sports, but you know, betting on every single casino game, you know, imaginable. Any gambling game, there are people who have made millions and multiple millions of dollars. And in some, in the case of sports betting, there are people who have made hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, there's definitely a way to do it. Um, it all it always is getting harder, right? I mean, if you if you did something forty years ago, you were the first one in. You know, you had the benefit of being the first one in, but you were also in an unproven territory. You didn't know if it was possible back then to make a hundred million dollars betting on sports. Um, now you do, but there's more people who know that, and so is more competition. So it's a um, it's the kind of thing where yes, it's definitely possible. One of the things that um, relating to, relating to this somewhat is, is the, the, um, one of the things that we're doing now with, with analytics.bet is we're, we're going to the state regulators and to the commissions and trying to educate people on, on that exact point to some extent to say that, you know, you, we can't have regulated, this regulated market is, is not, is, is crazy where, um, we're allowing, you know, Regulators should be on the part of the the constituents, the citizens of the state, the residents. Whereas, in fact, they're mostly operating in you know in the pockets of the corporate of the big big casinos. At a minimum, what what we should be able to what what you know we should be trying to promote is a minimum level of betting education and betting competency, uh, especially for people who are going to be betting over a certain threshold. If you bet over, you know. I don't know, whatever the number is, pick a number, you know, maybe it's a good idea to, um, to at least call attention to the fact, you know, do you know what the expected return on a, on a parlay, on a five leg parlay is? Do you know what, you know, what the, what the return on a single game on these single game parlays are, you know, and it's not to say that if, if you, you know, it's okay to, you know, if you know that you're losing 40% on a bet and you choose to make it anyway, that's, you know, we can say maybe that's okay. But I think that there's so much, you know, misleading content, you know, out there, especially, you know, a lot of it's being put out by the sports books, you know, to say, you know, picking, you know, the, the winner of the day, the lock of the week, the lock of the century and, and everything in between. And, you know, all of the advertisements are geared towards getting people to bet. And of course, those people tend to lose, and so they have the opinion that you just you just said, which is that it's impossible to win. I think a, a minimum level of, of betting education, not to say everybody has to become a professional, but at least to understand what it is that they're doing, what minus one ten means, uh, in some kind of mathematical sense, I think would would go a long way to actually sustaining the industry, uh, it, it, which it, is what everybody it, wants. It sounds like you're advocating for responsible gambling, a real true message of responsible gambling, not what the sports books currently pretend is responsible gambling. I mean, essentially, essentially, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, what, one last uh, thing here, uh, uh, Harry, you know, you've, you've mentioned it numerous times um, throughout uh throughout the uh, interview here, um, but you work with a group of people, correct? I work with a few people, yeah. Um, how important is it to work with a group? I've, I mean, for me, I, I guess I can, I can say, looking back, I've never um, been able to do anything successfully without, you know, on, on my own. I mean, poker, poker, I guess is the, is the last thing that I, I did. And I think to my detriment, I was very kind of isolated in, in, in that. And, and, and I didn't really, um, I mean, of course, poker is an individual game, but, but there are people who at least they share ideas. They, they've kind of, 
And I never really did that there. Um, I had success at poker, but I think I would have more success if you get into the right groups and you're able to kind of bounce ideas off each other for, for something like betting sports betting. I think, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm the lone wolf it's possible, but I, I think there's just so many, I, I think it's very, it's, it's very, you're really limited in what you're going to be able to, to get, especially when we talk about that, the logistical issues of getting limited, um, unless you're managing an entire team of, of betters and you're also running all these models and figuring all this stuff out yourself. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a hundred hour a week job minimum and, and you're, you're kind of always, always on, on call there. And, and, you know, I, I think that having, having a team and, and leveraging the strength of individuals, um, some people are going to be more mathematical. Some people are going to be more, you know, business oriented or logistical and practical. I think it's good to have, have, a, have a good mix. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent agree with you on that. So important. And, you know, you mentioned all those people over time who have won money betting on sports or, you know, betting on casino games or, or betting on anything, almost all of them did it as a group, right? No, not too many people did it as a, as a lone individual. Exactly. Yeah. Harry Crane, statistics professor and the founder of analytics.bet. Harry, what a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining the show. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, Pace. So that was Harry Crane. What a guy. Really interesting. You can tell he's got a very brilliant mind, especially when it comes to numbers. Uh, but a lot to take away from that. I've got some thoughts, but first, Pace, I want to hear yours. <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's that's what it's all about right there. Um, we've got a guy who's, um, you know, literally goodwill hunting level brilliant. You know, he he literally could play Matt Damon in goodwill hunting <laughs> and uh, uh, obviously has the um, the accolades to support um you know, his, his knowledge, his theories and, and everything that he's doing. Um, and like you said, before we started, <laughs> you said he started at a young age. I think he was a, a little bit below the, the legal betting age when he started betting it, he said eight or nine years old. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as thoughts go, there's a, there, there's a lot to unpack. Um, we've touched on pregame betting. I know at InPlay Live, a lot of times we have, uh, alluded to the time commitment of pregame betting. And then when you bring in the whole tipster model, which we've done a whole episode on, and you think about someone giving you picks, let's eliminate the scammers. Let's take them out of the equation entirely. And let's say that we've got Harry giving us the analytics and data and actually picking a game for us where you go, okay, all of this time commitment, which he really touched on multiple times, uh, he made reference to a 100-hour work week as it relates to building models. But then if you go to his uh, three points of execution, inf uh, three points uh, to success, info execution and analytics, uh, the analytics side of it, if you have a systematic edge over these main markets, so we're ignoring insider information and the execution of it, he's talking about a 1% to 3% edge. And we have touched on that a number of times as it relates to pregame pros. So that's his edge. So that means us as sports bettors, if we're following a guy like him, if he's not a tipster, but if we're following a guy like him, like him that is a tipster, right? Or if... um you know, we're paying for a service like this. Who's to say that we're getting the same line as him? So if he has a one to 3% edge and perhaps he's placing a wager where he's found that edge at minus 110. And by the time we get around to wagering it, we've bet it at minus 115 because we want to tail him. Well, we've lost the, the, the payment for that particular uh, subscription or, or tipster. We've lost that payment already that comes out of our edge and then we've betted a line where we've lost that one to three percent edge and might even have a theoretical uh negative uh long-term return based on not getting the same number so when you combine the information that he just gave us and i love everything he's doing everything he's doing is in line with bettering the betting industry with giving them education with giving them fish instead of a, uh, with giving them a fishing rod instead of uh, giving them a stinky fish a lot of overlap uh, with what we're doing with in play live but 
when you take these services, he's building his own models. You take these services that are all designed for us to get an edge and all the same people are using these systems in a similar way. He touched on it really, really well. The edge that he's working on and the systems he is working on is his information and his interpretation of them. So if you're taking a system that everyone else is then using to do the same thing yourself, well, then you've got to ask yourself, where actually is the edge? Yeah, that, that's a good point, right? Because you're you're all doing it at the same time, you know, in, in theory. And, you know, are you crushing those lines? You know, we talked about this on our episode a couple of weeks ago about dynamic lines. Are you dropping those those lines all the way down? And, and you know, some people inevitably end up getting in at a worse line, right? Um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Where you, 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 you know, could potentially lose that edge. Yeah. So the reason why I said all that it, it, the last thing I'm trying to do is discredit this guy. This guy's got more, this guy's like, you know, the, the more brilliant version of, of our whole group combined in, in a lot of ways from the standpoint of his actual uh, knowledge and, and mathematic background. Um, but I'm referencing to the recreational better that's purchasing some sort of package from a tipster. When you really uncover the hood of the best of the best, we just spoke to one of the best of the best pregame pros. And you, you know, anyone that's telling you that you that they have a bigger edge than this one to three percent edge and it's main market stuff that's being reproduced to someone that's that's pregame betting, you, you know, after listening to that, they're scamming you. It's just not accurate. It's just not true. Yeah, yeah, you, that's a really good point. Like this guy sort of, you know, is somebody who is quite, you know, after having that conversation and chatting with them, it's very clear that he's not a tipster, like you said. And it, it, the distinction between someone like that and somebody on Instagram who is telling you to go bet, you know, the Mets at minus 200 odds and do it right now are, are night and day, right? I mean, like, come on, you, you know, the, the difference is, is extraordinary. Yeah, and I don't think he's seen our podcast before. And then he came out talking about the lock of the week and all those same things and calling those people out because he does have such a profound knowledge of where success truly lies long term. And again, he's pooling money as a team. He's working as a team. So there's the element of being able to succeed where you you can't just do it on your own. I know you can do it on your own. I know that is possible. Um, but the power of you know the community and the and the team is obviously uh the greater than the individual right so <clears throat> he definitely alluded to that as well as a an overall you know part of the long term success um but you know it it is the syndicate type model right where where money is being pooled and then executed through through uh um account multiple accounts to get large sums of money um in on these pregame to to identify these edges and again if that is happening where we are talking about pooled money, pooled resources, and a lot of money coming in at once, um, it would be really hard to tail as a tipster, you know, tail a tipster as a recreational better, knowing that they got the the, the sharp line uh, and you potentially didn't. Yeah, you know, I, lo I love that you brought that up because that's something I wanted to talk about too. You know, here we have a guy, he's extremely sharp, clearly, but he's also recognized, I can't do this alone. I need people like me thinking like me and we need to work together as a group to be able to do this effectively. And, you know, one of the, the, the first moment where he brought up being part of a group, it was in our conversation around limiting, which I thought was interesting because he basically said, yeah, of course we get limited, but I don't deal with any of that stuff. <laughs> you know, I've got, <laughs> I've got a whole bunch of other people that are going to deal with that stuff for me. They take care of that. I take care of the modeling and the analytics and that side of things. So, you know, a very sort of clear division of labor, which I thought was really interesting here with, with you know, the operation that, that he's a part of. But also, too, I mean, we've seen with sports books where they say in their terms and conditions or shut you down or didn't pay you specifically because they accused you of being a syndicate. And one of the things that I do love about in play live is we do execute individually as a community. And what I mean by that, if you're watching and you're not a part of the community is that we're not betting for you. We aren't taking you, you know, your funds and then distributing them and then giving you a return. You're going through all of those processes yourself. 
<clears throat> and that allows you from the standpoint of being accused of being a syndicate to actually provide evidence that it is in fact you placing the wagers, your devices, your IP address, your accounts, your money, your bank accounts, the list goes on and on. So um, I do like that from the standpoint of, of what it is that we're doing. But at the same time, you know, when I think about purifying the betting industry, what we stand for in this, uh, this podcast, and obviously with the community of InPlay Live, it only benefits us to interact with uh, guys like Harry because um, we gain knowledge. Knowledge is power. Uh, we gain a little bit more information, potentially leading to greater edges or, or more sustainable and long-term edges. Obviously, sustainability was something that he really touched on uh, with all this, which actually um, kind of mimicked DK's sentiment uh, with respect to the legalization of the books that you guys touched on uh, mm -hmm. last week. Uh, and then as it relates to books trying to become more profitable and really honing in on sharp betters being <laughs> their, their, uh, their way to appease stockholders and shareholders uh, going forward. Uh, but yeah, from the sustainability standpoint of, of you know, potentially collaborating with uh, Harry or guys like him that uh, can continue to better uh, our community and then potentially, obviously, uh, uh, better his as well. Um, and that the, the prospect of that type of thing, again, from the standpoint of purifying the betting industry is just it's exciting. Yeah, it really, you know, I loved what, what he said about that. And before, uh, before I forgot, I just want to mention, you know, I don't know how Harry's organization works. I don't know the intricacies of, of how those relationships work. All I know is what all of you heard in the interview. So I just want to make that clear. I don't want to, you know, say, oh, hey, you know, he is a syndicate or anything. If, if anybody out there from sports books is listening or anything like that, uh, I, I, we, we don't know exactly how it works within the group that he's working with. So I just want to make that clear. But I did love that element of, you know, he's also somebody who like us pace and, and the whole purpose behind our podcast here about, you know, educating recreational sports betters and sort of helping people understand the landscape and, you know, avoiding the pitfalls is something that he's advocating for and his group is advocating for as well. And, you know, sort of lobbying the regulators and reaching out to them and sort of making these suggestions that, hey, maybe the sports books could do a better job at educating their customers about what exactly it is that they're engaging in. And so I, I really appreciated uh, uh, that element that that he kind of brought to the conversation because, yeah, that's exactly what we're all about. And, you know, I didn't know that he was going to come with that. So it, it's really encouraging to see other people out there who are as sharp as him, who are also taking the same approach and recognizing that the landscape isn't fair, that it needs to become at least a little bit more level, if not, you know, a completely even playing field. Totally. Yeah. And he touched on like, Hey, you're about to make a parlay. It's got a negative 40% ROI <laughs> <laughs> on it. Right. Um, would people still make the parlay? Yes. Um, but would people potentially look at what they're doing a little bit differently? Yes, as well. And I don't think that that's a realistic expectation that the books would actually ever provide, but perhaps somewhere in, in the site, there could be that level of information provided to players and they might have to, you know, click an accept, uh, an accept or agree button where they go, you know, Th this is the nature of what it is that we're promoting. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't read it, but at least it would then be offered. And I would consider that to be a true, a true responsible gaming tool, as opposed to obviously the, the ones that we've touched on in, in previous episodes of this podcast. Now, I do want to touch on a couple things um, that I haven't yet <clears throat> uh, that he brought up. So he talked about his th sort of three pillars, the info, execution, and analytics. You know what's really crazy about this, and this is really speaks to teams because I have some experience not with this myself from as a sports better because of the the nature of the way I wager and how I really do try to view analytics and news as noise to a certain extent and just really focus on you know what's actually happening when the game is on. Um, but information. So he talked about information, um, and I think that he he kind of skipped over a, a word there, and it, it is unique information. He's referring to information that other people do not have. Yeah, he um, called it insider with, information, but that's what it is, essentially. Yeah, right? which, it's I information mean, no one else has. Which, you know, technically speaking, would be illegal in the stock market. But, you know, in the world of sports betting, it's not, which I mean, if you can beat the books, I say power to you. So um, it's cool. I've, I've heard of some stories of people that, uh, you know, have have a team again, where one of those team members is is deployed in in an actual stadium. And they could be looking at anything from the Super Bowl um, color of the Gatorade bath to the performers halftime um, outfit to uh, getting a lineup uh, before it's released online um, for maybe a, a, a low market college game. 
where you have a piece of information about a certain player that is hugely impactful that that isn't playing before that actually information isn't released or sorry it is released so you get you get that edge and uh, with respect to that kind of stuff it really is a race to market <clears throat> and again that speaks to the fact that he isn't a tipster because he knows that he has that edge and that edge is in such a small time frame where he collects that information before people in whatever capacity that it is that he can to then place his wager. And by the time he would place it and then release that information, we're talking about sometimes seconds, which actually has a lot of parallels to what we do with live betting. And I'm not referring to necessarily a player not playing or playing live, but a play that happens where we potentially gain an edge on the books or a play that happens that changes the algorithm in the books where book A reacts in a certain way to that situation occurring, where book B reacts in a different way. The way they react is similar, but it can just be just enough difference where we actually can get that, that theoretical value or that edge live. Uh, the difference with the live aspect of it is for us, it's about what we're actually watching and listening to in real time. Whereas in this case, it's before the game started and gaining that information, which leads us to the second thing that he brought up, which was execution. So you get the unique information, <clears throat> and then how are you actually going to execute to profit? And then you have this short window of time to execute on it before that market is taken down, before um, the public hears about it, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and it really comes down to uh, speed. And there's a lot of parallels there with um, with what we do live in the sense that sometimes we get a line that we only have one to five seconds to actually slip the wager in. And you'll see with a group of people like within Play Live, maybe 10% of the members actually spun the bet in. Maybe 5% did, uh, maybe 50% did, but there was this tight window where 100% of the people were not able to get in on that particular line. Um, so execution obviously being huge and then he talked about the systematic edge which is the one to three percent edge and the analytics that he uses to create those models to to gain those edges so uh definitely sounded like the big edges that he get gets like those three four hundred percent ones that he alluded to were were based off of um uh, some of that unique information and obviously the execution, but then also from the analytics standpoint, perhaps taking on uh, a piece of information or, or data that the books aren't really privy to and, uh, and having a, a large edge, which usually, again, when you come to those ones, those sort of situations, there's a time frame associated to how long you can actually execute on those ones for until the books adjust. Uh, adjust to them um so but really really cool stuff and i know for a fact like having that guy in our group um would be really powerful uh for all of our members but also on the flip side i, I i'm very confident that he would find uh, tremendous new avenues of of making money that uh, he never knew existed before um with what we're doing meshing with uh, what he's doing I, I think you're absolutely right on that. And when I talked about, hey, are you betting pregame or are you betting live? And he was like, oh, mostly pregame, but I haven't really explored betting live too much. I was thinking in my head, I'm like, hey, buddy, we, we can help you explore. <laughs> you know, we can, we can give you a hand there. Um, and I do think that he would probably be able to find um, a ton of value live. He would be able to sort of, you know, just really excel. Um, and, and people like him. I don't want to just say it's just him, but if you're out there and you're listening or you're watching, you know, and, and you're sort of in that area already and you're already in this space, you know, yeah, you know, if, if you're only betting pregame and you do have models and you do have a strong background in statistics, analytics, and data, you know, joining a community like Inplay Live can really help you elevate that and apply it to live sports wagering. And I was thinking about it, I was, you know, Let's say a guy like Harry tells me that, you know, basketball game between the Nuggets and the Heat, you know, is going to go over 200 points. And he's telling me this pregame. Well, I can use that as sort of a signpost that kind of says it, it doesn't dictate how I'm going to wager live. But I know Harry, who's got this incredible model, says it's going to go over 200 points and then the game is live and I'm watching it. And now it's gone down to 180 points, but I can say, Hey, Harry's model was saying as much as 200 points. Maybe that's another reason to like the over in this game and maybe combine that with a whole bunch of other information, you know, to give 
an even stronger edge or to create that edge, you know, and really kind of just using the analytics, the data, the, the background, in, you know, as you sort of referred to it as noise, but not so much noise, not also complete guidance, but something to be aware of, something to give information and to help, you know, better inform your decision making process while betting on sports live. Totally. And I mean, he'd probably be the first one to tell you there's been games that he bets on where it just goes completely the other way from from tip to tip, like, you yeah. know, so. And that's sports. That's chaos. And, you know, we yeah. talked a little bit about that, too, of course, in, in there. Yeah, so. He said something that I really liked. Uh, he, I'm going back to the time commitment. He really touched on that quite a bit. He talked, talked about the 100 hour work week, the amount of time it takes and the amount of work it all is to to be a successful pregame sports better. Uh, he, he mentioned a line that I loved. He said, it's harder than you want it to be. So you better love it. Um, and I think that live betting, sometimes people will say to us at in play live, you know, the time commitment was too much for me, but sometimes I look during certain times of the year, especially where I go, geez, we're getting these edges, putting in this little amount of time, um, you know, a couple hours a night, sometimes it's, uh, it's really awesome. So, uh, something to be grateful for, I think, um, with our community. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Pace, I, I really enjoyed the interview. Um, that's all the thoughts I had on it. I thought it was great to connect with Harry. Pace, any final thoughts, final words, anything you want to share with the audience before we yeah. say goodbye till next week? Yeah. So if you take our chaos episode and you take this episode um, and where you talked about trying to kind of quantify or, or you know, put the, the chaos into uh, a bucket that potentially could be value, he's not predicting the future, guys. It's very important to understand that. He's trying to identify value, and it sounds like he does so uh, successfully, especially uh, with respect to the times that he doesn't have insider information. And just because you get a bit of insider information doesn't mean that the game's going to go a certain way. It means that you're getting value on the lines. He talked about buying out of them. So mm -hmm. if you get information early and you're able to buy out, it means that you didn't even need to watch the game or the result of the game didn't even matter. The profit was made uh, before the game actually even started. So always keep that in mind going forward um, with respect to uh, any edges, any tipsters, any models like this, and especially analytics services. I'm not speaking out against analytics services. I want that to be clear. But he made it very clear that his edges are different and each pro's edges or system's edges should be different. So what that means is if you're using a system that's generating edges that all sort of bring sharp betters to the same space, that 1% to 3% edge is likely going to be gone or even that much more minimized. So can you make money doing that? Yes, but it's more likely than not that doing all of that work using someone else's system is likely just going to lead you to tread water, okay? Now, you might think, well, how could this guy say this as he's you know, <laughs> sitting here <laughs> with his own betting service? Well, of course, the reason with that is the success that we've had from our members, but the nature of live betting where you do have that short window to get something in based on what you're seeing both on the books and their lines and obviously what's going on in the, the rink, the court or the field and that leading to sustainable long-term profits. And that would be the last thing that I would touch on is he did really harp on sustainability. And a huge aspect of that is um, your sports books and, and not getting limited. And the, the simple reality is, is that you will get limited. So you do need to find uh, sustainable long-term sports books that don't limit you like Pinnacle and Bookmaker. Uh, and then uh, sports books um, potentially using offshore channels or, or, or other opportunities uh, to keep the, uh, to keep, uh, things coming in so that it isn't like this one or two year thing uh, that just makes you a little bit of cash. And uh, I'm evidence that that works. And I believe that um, uh, Harry is as well. You know, if it, the guy's been betting since he was eight years old and he's still he's still here. I mean, he, he knows how to work around some of the sports books to continue to, to get action. So um, I've been doing this for uh, well over a decade and can speak to that as well. So um, yeah, really great information. Um, Harry, if you're listening, thanks for joining us. Uh, that was really awesome. Hopefully we can have him back on in the future and continue to have uh, really sharp and guests like that to make Shane to make us look smarter than we are. 
I don't know. I don't know that that that, that that's the outcome pace. I, it's probably the reverse all around. But you know what? I really enjoy those conversations because I learned so much. And you know, it's yeah. I enjoy my conversations with you too, Pace, because I learned a lot from you. And what you and Harry both have in common is that you are both what what Bet Analytics or Analytics Bet and In Play Live are both doing. And you touched on this: is you're not giving people stinky fish. You're teaching yeah. people how to fish. It's just a couple of the different ways. Really enjoyed exploring the different ways. Pace, buddy, always enjoy our conversations. Till next week, keep eating those books. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Lines. Remember to like, download, and subscribe. We are on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Have a betting story or want to be featured on our podcast? Drop a note in the comments below. And if you want to join in play live, use promo code Behind the Lines.